Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, when will we be going live? Sorry, sir. Uh, when are we going to be live? Sir, it's already in live, sir. Okay, fine. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, so shall we uh, start the session? Yes, sir. Okay. So good evening all. So I'm here to do a quick recap on the endocrinology session of the 
the recently uh, conducted neat ss examination so i hope everybody has done their part well and i wish you all the best in advance so first of all i would like to address how many questions were from endocrinology so of course it is difficult to say uh, what were exclusively from endocrinology and what is the number of questions that had overlap because how to draw the line it's always a difficult uh, question to answer so but i should say that around 17 or 18 questions were from core endocrinology and another six or seven questions had overlap from other subjects like cardiology nephrology then uh, medical genetics etc so coming to the difficulty of this paper uh, around this 20 endocrinology questions that we had in our exam i would say around 12 questions were pretty straightforward you can they were like one line of type you can straight away go for the answer and another five questions you can get the answer by ruling out other uh, options and by applying some logic and i should say that there were three to four questions which uh, caused quite a bit of confusion among the uh, candidates and i would like to specifically discuss on that three or four questions and uh, we will have an overall picture and i would also like to highlight so how many questions were directly picked from harrison and how many were from specialty books and how many from their recent advances so without further introduction i would go straight into the first question and i would be starting with a controversial question itself so the drug known to have an effect in delaying or preventing the onset of type 2 diabetes mellitus so i have tried to include the options which i collected from the students there may be some mistakes you can uh, type in the chat box if you feel that this was not the correct option which was asked in the exam or you can type in your suggestions also or the modifications that are to be made so which are the drugs whether it is pioglitazone empagliflozin metformin or glimepiride so empagliflozin and glimepiride so far there are no trials which have definitely looked into the diabetes prevention capability of the drugs but the confusion which caused is that both pioglitazone and metformin has had specific trials which has looked into the preventing the progression of pre diabetes to diabetes so pioglitazone has a trial called act now and metformin has multiple trials in fact diabetes prevention program is the most uh, famous trial with metformin and diabetes prevention so if you want me to compare the diabetes prevention ability of pioglitazone and metformin i would say pioglitazone would be a stronger one but still even after 10 years of publishing the pioglitazone trial which is the act now even now there are no professional bodies which are recommending pioglitazone for the uh, prevention of type 2 diabetes plus in harrison they are highlighting only the metformin part metformin the uh, role of metformin in preventing diabetes the diabetes prevention program and in fact metformin is the only medication which is endorsed by a professional organization ada for preventing diabetes in high risk categories like uh, ob severe obesity and women with history of gdm so i would say even though both has got ability in preventing diabetes i believe that the examiner had metformin in his mind while uh, putting this question and it is most likely that metformin would be the key uh, the answer given in the answer key so i would go for metformin as the drug which prevents or delays the onset of type 2 diabetes so i hope that is clear for all of you the explanation second question is a pretty straight forward question diabetes mellitus with multiple uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular morbidities and uh, is also having ckd stage 3 on multiple medications which is the drug which will exert most cardioprotective effect so there is no confusion for that harrison itself mentions empagliflozin which is the sglt2 inhibitor as the drug to go for in patients with high risk for ascvd so met empagliflozin is the answer for this question so third question again a, a question which raised a bit of confusion young male with complaints of body pain high serum calcium low serum phosphorus nodules over face and cafe au lait macules with smooth borders 
So when you look at this, I have highlighted the important points in blue in the question. We have high serum calcium and low serum phosphorus. So obviously, uh, hyperparathyroidism is a possibility. And along with that, the patient is also having generalized body pain, which I uh, failed to mention in the question. He also had joint or body pain, nodules over the face, and cafe ole macules with smooth borders. I would say that is the catch in this question. Cafe ole macules with smooth borders. So now let's analyze the options. McCune Albright syndrome, whether it can produce high serum calcium, it is extremely, extremely rare, and there is no known association between hyperparathyroidism and McCune Albright syndrome, even though cafe ole macules may be seen, but it has got a cost of main appearance, which has got irregular borders. So the cafe ole macules in McCune Albright syndrome has irregular borders and also even though it can produce low serum phosphorus by FGF23 overaction, it can produce joint pain by uh, occurrence of fibrous dysplasia. It will not produce a smooth cafeola macule. It will not produce high serum calcium. So macune albright is out. And hyperparathyroidism, jaw tumor syndrome, it is not associated with uh, cafeola macules or facial nodules, just a mandibular or maxillary tumor. Jaw tumor will be there. Whereas neurofibromatosis, the association has been described between neurofibromatosis and primary hyperparathyroidism, although the association is not as strong as we've seen with a pheochromocytoma and neurofibromatosis or a somatostatinoma, but still there are reports which shows the coexistence of primary hyperpara in a patient with neurofibromatosis. And of course, the joint pain could be due to the pseudoarthrosis and the facial nodules could be the neurofibromas. So again, the, uh, this is the comparison of the cafe ole macules between McTune albright, which has got irregular borders, and neurofibromatosis, which has smooth borders. So our diagnosis is neurofibromatosis 1 with hyperparathyroidism. Again, a straightforward question true regarding Menwin syndrome. Parathyroid hyperplasia uh, is common, which again uh, is a correct statement regarding Menwin. Proto-oncogene defect. So uh, proto-oncogene defect, it is not seen in men one because menin gene is a tumor suppressor gene. And uh, marfanoid habitus, it is seen in men 2B. And medullary carcinoma thyroid, it is also present in men 2A and men 2B. So the answer for this question would be parathyroid hyperplasia. So men one can produce both parathyroid hyperplasia as well as parathyroid adenoma. Now, again, a, uh, a concept-based question. So a clinical scenario of a patient with diabetes insipidus was given and the urine osmolality from what I could garner from the students, the value was around 220 milliosmol per liter at baseline. And once desmopressin was administered, urine osmolality increased to 280. So they have also given 30, 20% to 30 percentage increase from baseline. So what is the subtype? whether it is central DI, partial central, nephrogenic or partial nephrogenic. So the key point in this question is that how much the urine osmolality has increased from the baseline and what is the eventual urine osmolality it has reached. So here is how we classify diabetes insipidus based on the response to desmopressin. So if the absolute value of urine osmolality doesn't go beyond 300, then that is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So here in our patient also, it has not gone beyond 300. It is only 280. So it is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now we want to know whether it is a partial nephrogenic or a complete nephrogenic DI. So you can see here, in partial nephrogenic DI, the urine osmolality increase will be 15 to 45 percentage, whereas the urine osmolality increase will be less than 15 percentage in complete nephrogenic DI. So here it is around 30 percentage increase. So our answer could be answer should be partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And uh, one of the doctors have asked a question. Uh, and Dr. Shishsuke has mentioned that he has read an article which had suggested pyoglitazone over metformin for preventing diabetes mellitus that is exactly the point I've already mentioned. If you compare the efficacy 
of diabetes prevention in the acnow trial the pioglitazone had a 70 percentage reduction in diabetes prevention whereas metformin in the diabetes prevention program had only 30 to 35 percentage but what may be more important is that whether that diabetes reduction potential can be translated into clinical benefit so even in the acnow trial the conclusion say like this even though it produced a significant reduction in type 2 diabetes incidence it occurred at the incidence of increased risk of edema and weight gain so that is probably the reason why despite that encouraging result pioglitazone it's is not pitched to uh, give for a pre diabetes patient to prevent type 2 diabetes so anything depending on the key both metformin and pioglitazone are eligible answers but what i feel personally based on the clinical use of metformin and as well as what is mentioned in harrison the key is likely to contain metformin as the answer for that question again i totally accept that con con uh, comment and i would also uh, if i had the liberty i would give uh, marks for both the options but that is not the case in re real life so i think metformin would be the better answer but i i advise you not to be surprised if the key contains pioglitazone also because it is such a sort of question it entirely depends on who the examiner is and what was he having in his mind when he put that question so i hope uh, that doubt is clear so coming to the next question patient with intracranial hemorrhage was given mannitol for two days and thereafter he developed polyuria with 24 to 48 hours of treatment the serum osmolality was 280 urine osmolality was 110 and i doubt whether urine sodium is 10 because some of the students have mentioned that urine sodium was given and some said that urine sodium was not so anyway you can just keep there and what is the likely diagnosis whether it is siadh osmotic diuresis nephrogenic di or central di so siadh is straight away out because if adh is excess in a uh, circulation then it will produce increase water reabsorption so polyuria is not a feature of siadh and if you believe the urine sodium result that also rules out siadh so siadh is out second osmotic diuresis so osmotic diuresis means due to the effect of mannitol it is driving excess of sodium into the urine so when more of sodium is lost in the urine of course urine sodium will be high so so will be the urine osmolality so urine osmolality will be almost always more than 300 in a patient patient with osmotic diuresis and this mannitol being an effective osmol will also increase the serum osmolality so both serum osmolality will increase urine osmolality will increase urine sodium will also increase in a patient on mannitol and nephrogenic di there is no clinical setting for developing a nephrogenic di and there are no mention of any drugs which can result in nephrogenic di and so considering all the clinical scenario because a patient had developed the intracranial hemorrhage or intracranial trauma which is a setting for developing central di although the serum osmolality is not very typical of central di because you expect the serum osmolality to be on the high normal range or even high maybe more than 290 but still you can explain that by uh, that the patient may be taking excessive amount of hypotonic solution in the form of free water or he may be getting excess of 5% dextrose that could be one of the reason here his serum osmolality is in the low normal range but among these four options central diabetes insipidus is the best one and some of the students have confused it with osmotic diuresis but that is definitely not the answer because osmotic diuresis will produce increased serum and urine osmolality so that is uh, definitely ruled out and dr aman is mentioning that urine sodium was not given so even without urine sodium i think you can pretty much rule out other options and you can choose central diabetes insipidus as your final answer again another question of confusion 10 year old child with short stature with a high test ds of minus 5 i think that is the most important catch in this question high test ds of minus 5 along with small head a uh, small gonads with absent pubertal changes and a tsh of 6.4 what is the likely diagnosis i hope the question is complete and there are no missing links in the question so first option whether it is de morsier syndrome so de morsier syndrome is nothing but septo optic dysplasia the patient will have agenesis of septum pellucidum 
and optic nerve deformities will be there. So it is not mentioned in the question, so that is out. And Rieger syndrome, the classic feature in Rieger syndrome is the accent field Rieger anomaly, which is the anterior chamber abnormality of the eye, increasing the risk of glaucoma. That is also not mentioned here, so that is also out. Now, the struggle is between Noonan syndrome and Laron syndrome. So, Noonan syndrome, whether short stature can occur, yes. Microcephaly can occur, yes. Small gonads can occur, maybe yes, but although it's rare, but it can occur. TSH of 6, it is borderline, it may or may not occur. But what about Laron syndrome? But the height SDS in Noonan syndrome will usually be within minus 1 to minus 2. So this much severe short stature is not a feature of Noonan syndrome. Whereas in Laron syndrome, which is GH insensitivity, it is clearly mentioned in Williams endocrinology that the height SDS will be between minus 4 to minus 10 SD below the mean. They will have small head circumference and genitalia are small and the puberty is delayed. So in a 10-year-old boy, we cannot say it has delayed puberty, but still the genitalia are small and also the gonads are also small. So everything fits with Laron dwarfism. So the best answer from the given options would be Laron syndrome and not Noonan syndrome. Next question. A 45-year-old postmenopausal female had complaints of hot flushes. She also has moderate cardiovascular risk, which would be the most suited treatment option for her complaint. So now, for complaint of hot flushes, definitely she would require estrogen. Although progestin may also be helpful, but she require estrogen of some sort to relieve of her symptom. So whether it is transdermal, whether it is stibalon, whether it is OCP. So progestin only pill is unlikely. So we are already ruling out that option. OCP is never used in postmenopausal female because of the very high dose of estrogen in it. So compared to the menopausal hormone therapy, OC pills contain around five to six times higher dose of estrogen. Of course, in a patient with moderate severe risk, that is not advised. So OCP is out first. Now between transdermal estrogen patch and tibalon. So many of the students were not very acquainted with the properties of tibalon. So I think some of them have chosen tibalon as the answer. But actually what is tibalon? Tibalon is nothing but a estrogen it is, is a molecule with estrogen-like action. It has also got progestogenic action as well as androgenic action. So is tibalon, giving tibalon will be same as that of giving an oral estrogen preparation with regards to the cardiovascular and stroke risk. In fact, tibalon has been found to increase the risk of strokes and mildly increase the risk of heart attacks. So is pulmonary thromboembolism. So the best option would be transdermal estrogen patch and which is also given in the endocrine society practice guidelines if the cardiovascular risk is moderate you would go for a transdermal treatment so the answer would be transdermal estrogen patch and this is about tibalon which is an alternative to mhd we need not give progestin along with tibalon because it itself has got some progestogenic action now Next question, a type 1 diabetes female with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, she is also a non-case of systemic hypertension controlled on medications. Which contraceptive measure would you avoid for this patient? So even if you don't know the answer straight away, you can just rule out all the options. So copper D, it is actually a metabolically inert substance that so that would not interfere with the metabolic parameters of the patient. So you can definitely rule out copper T as the answer. So second, progestin-only pills. And in order to differentiate between OCPs and progestin-only pills, you will have to refer to the this guideline given by the WHO. So this is for the use of which contraception to be used in a patient with uh, diabetes mellitus. Here you can see that if the category is 3 and 4, then they are not preferred. So in a diabetes patient who is having neuropathy, retinopathy or uh, nephropathy, the least preferred is the combined oral contraceptive pills. So combined oral contraceptive pills is the least preferred medication and followed by uh, the high-dose progesterone and followed by this progesterone implant. 
so the answer for this question would be so answer for this question would be combined oral contraceptive pills so that is the one that you would not like to choose for the treatment of this patient now again a trick question a type of mutation seen in achondroplasia so i think most of you would be knowing that the achondroplasia is due to fgfr3 mutation so that is no confusion but you may have a confusion whether it is activating whether it is inactivating what is the type of mutation and you may be thinking that fgfr3 it should play some role in the growth and so with achondroplasia because it being a disease causing short stature it is likely to be a uh, inactivating mutation or a nonsense or a missense mutation but actually the pathway goes like this the ras pathway this ras pathway which activates the mek pathway it will actually prevent the chondrocyte proliferation and this fgfr3 receptor stimulation will actually stimulate the ras pathway so when fgfr3 is stimulated this ras pathway is also stimulated which will suppress the chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation so what is actually happening in achondroplasia is that it is a case of activating mutation of fgfr3 so that there is overaction of the ras pathway resulting in short stature one more genetic syndrome associated with activation of the ras pathway is nunan syndrome due to ptpn11 gene mutation so one question which may come for your iniss if you are going for endocrinology is new drug which is approved for achondroplasia is vasoretide how because vasoretide this binds on this cnp uh, receptor this natriuretic peptide receptor thereby it inhibits the fgf pathway so vasoretide is approved for treatment in achondroplasia and achondroplasia is due to the activating mutation of fgf r3 so uh, yes uh, dr aman is mentioning gain of function was given of course they both mean the same and it is a gain of function mutation in fgf r3 so straight forward question which require no further explanation the glp1 unlock which is used orally it is semaglutide only so another straight forward question with regards to primary aldosteronism hypokalemic hypertension don't need confirmation with saline loading metabolic acidosis is seen or saline loading doesn't suppress aldosterone levels so of course it is associated with severe metabolic alkalosis which again is a one liner from harrison so the uh, metabolic acidosis is seen in primary aldosteronism that is the wrong statement and of course the answer which of the following conditions is associated with small joint contractures fanconi bickel hereditary tyrosinemia gaucher type 1 or mps type 1 in fact mps type 2 is the one which has been associated with maximum incidence of contractures and uh, whereas mps1 the hurler syndrome also has contracture as one of its feature whereas gaucher disease type 2 is associated with contracture type 1 is not associated with contracture fanconi bickel no contracture hereditary tyrosinemia it may be present but only in very advanced stages so from these four options the best answer would be mps1 so type 2 gaucher if it was present then we may have to uh, choose between those two but again type 1 is given in the option i presume so the best answer from the given options is mps1 which is hurler syndrome next question a patient with uti started on gentamicin after a week of therapy developed constellation of electrolyte abnormalities in the form of hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis hypercalciuria hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia so even if you don't know what happens or what is the tubular side effect of gentamicin from the given data itself you can guess what the patient is having so gentamicin itself can produce fanconi syndrome it can produce a, a loop of henle uh, defect mimicking a barter syndrome or it can even result in uh, distal renal tubular acidosis so all forms of renal tubular toxicity can occur with gentamicin so among this as you know this hypercalciuria is the single most important finding in this patient which differentiates between a gentleman like syndrome and barter syndrome of course you may not confuse it with hypomagnesemia because even in theory we may say that hypomagnesemia is seen more often in gentleman syndrome but actually it is an overlapping features 
hypomagnesemia may be seen in a significant proportion of barter syndrome also whereas hypercalciuria is the specific finding which points our diagnosis to uh, barter like syndrome and why we are calling barter syndrome type 5 because usually in a barter syndrome you don't experience hypocalcemia we may get hypercalciuria but hypocalcemia is not very rare so barter syndrome type 5 initially described as an activating mutation of the casr gene the calcium sensing receptor of the loop of henle which result in the calcium wasting and hypocalcemia so it is said that gentamicin can activate this calcium sensing receptor producing all these abnormalities so this is the classification you can see in barter type 5 it is due to casr activating mutation and gentamicin can activate this casr mimicking a barter syndrome type 5 to produce hypocalcemia so the answer is barter syndrome type 5 and hypomagnesemia may confuse you but it is seen in both little man and barter so little syndrome is due to gain of function mutation again a straightforward question it is epithelial sodium channel it is given in the endocrine hypertension part in harrison so next question maternal uniparental disomy is seen in so although it may appear to be a straightforward simple question i've heard that many of the students have confused it between prader willi and Angelman syndrome. So it is important to know that Prader-Willi syndrome, P4P, paternal deletion occurs in Prader-Willi syndrome or maternal uniparental disomy. So in Prader-Willi syndrome, both the normal, uh, the maternal allele is silenced. That means maternal allele cannot exert its physiological function. Only paternal allele is active. So Prader-Willi syndrome result when the deletion of the only active paternal allele occur or when both the alleles are inherited from the mother itself. So mother's alleles are already silenced. So when both the maternal alleles are present, so there will be a situation similar to a loss of function condition. So Prader-Willi syndrome can be due to paternal deletion in chromosome 15P or due to maternal uniparental disomy. The reverse is what we see in Angelman syndrome where it is maternal deletion or paternal uniparental disomy. So the answer for this question is Prader-Willi syndrome. So child with obesity, retinal degeneration and renal defects, again a straightforward question, even in Harrison, it is Bardet-Biedel syndrome. And this is how you differentiate between Bardet-Biedel and lawrence moon Biedel syndrome. So again, what is, which is not a condition resulting in premature aging, we have four options and Werner syndrome, progeria and cocaine are actually hallmark syndromes where uh, the premature aging is present and larum dwarfism, which is growth hormone insensitivity has not been linked to premature aging. So that would be the obvious choice. So a few other questions, which is again a straightforward from Harrison, insulin action in hyperkalemia lasts for around only four to six hours and daily water requirement per kilocalorie of energy used is 1 to 1 1.5 ml per kilocalorie. So I've included only 20 questions for uh, the discussion today. The rest of the other overlapping questions will be discussed as part of other specialty and cardiology and neurology, some of them which has already been discussed. So I'm not going to do that. So from the 20 questions I have discussed, any of you are having any uh, doubt, then you can post the Query in the chat box now. So I'll be waiting for two to three minutes for any questions. And meanwhile, I wait for questions. I would also like to uh, send message to all the INISS endocrinology aspirants that talk tutorials will be forming uh, or will be releasing separate training modules for INISS preparation for each specialty. And I'll be dealing with the endocrinology section. And in a few days time, I'll be forming dedicated WhatsApp groups and Telegram groups for those who are keenly pursuing for INISS endocrinology, where you will be given how to prepare for the endocrine part, what all things you should do, what all things you shouldn't do, and how do you go about the medicine part. And we are also planning to do a quick revision module, just like we did for NEAT-SS, we will be doing a quick capsule-like formulation for INISS also. 
and in case of any queries or clarifications you can whatsapp in my number and uh, for adding into the whatsapp group also you can request me in this number so so one of the doctors is asking how many endo seats are there so it depends on the session of iniss i think in the upcoming session around uh, 9 to 10 seats will be there for endocrinology in aims jipmer and pgi aims jodhpur also has seat apart from aims delhi then uh, jipmer and pgi also has seat whereas in the next session the april session they will be having only around 6 seats i presume so it is a very tight competition for the endocrinology and only the best will go through. So you have to ensure that you are fully equipped and prepared before facing that big exam. So I think doc tutorials can lend help in all possible ways for making you prepared for the exam. I think you are already experiencing that in your INI preparation phase also because we have been with, with you all this time available round the clock for you, clarifying all your doubts. And we will be continuing to do the same in the future. All the faculties are extremely dedicated to help you out so as you get a better seat of your choice. So if so, Dr. Rijo Sabu is telling hypercalciuria was not given in that gender mixing question. So again, uh, what from one of some of the feedback I got was that hypercalciuria was present. So even if hypercalciuria was not present if you look at the other abnormalities even though i said that hyper if hypercalciuria is there then there is no question regarding the uh, diagnosis it is barter syndrome itself even otherwise so I, I presume then the hypocalcemia would be given so hypocalcemia is not present with gittleman syndrome or any other syndrome which is mentioned in the uh, question and the most common tubular manifestation gentamicin resulting in hypomagnesemia and all is barter syndrome itself where it can directly bind to the casr so even if hypercalciuria was not given in the question then even then barter syndrome type 5 would be the best bet among the options and coming the neat ss seats and from the neat ss i think now around uh, total of around 100 to 110 seats for endocrinology are there, including the DNB seats. So if you are aspiring endocrinology, there is a good chance that you may get into endocrinology in a reputed inst uh, institution from the NEET SS exam itself. Because the when I gave the exam some three years back, the number of seats was only 50 or 60. And in the last three years, the number of seats have already doubled to more than 100. So there is a good chance that you can get into uh, DM endo because the seat has increased many fold. So any more clarification re you require? Anyways, I'll always be available on WhatsApp. You can post all your queries, even if uh, you are not able to watch this live and uh, post questions. You can, after this video, you can note my number and can message me regarding all the queries and clarifications that you re I'd require. And with your permission, I am signing off. So thank you. Have a good day.